Amen and amen. This is one of those mornings where all of us are doing about two or three different things, so pardon the exchange here. Many thanks to our jubilation ringers. I love the chimes. I like bells, but I love the chimes too. Good morning. And welcome to worship. A beautiful fall, fall morning. It's going to get up into the high 80s again today. Um, okay, I was, I was uh, asking Jesse, okay, how long did it take to come down last night? That Iowa game, holy buckets of cheese. Um, Iowa State, um, yeah, probably the best left unsaid. That was not a pleasant outcome. You and I, they won. Karen is happy. Uh, she's uh, at the um, breast cancer walk this morning, but that seemed to be one of those no defense, 44-41. There was another game I saw like that. Uh, uh, Ole Miss won. I can't remember who they were playing, but it was another one where it was like 50 to 55 to 52 or something along those lines, so no defense there. Um, I know Prairie and Solon had their homecomings. I'm not sure about Mount Vernon. Solon and Mount Vernon won. Prairie unfortunately lost a close one, uh, but that's how it goes. But it was a beautiful day to be out, beautiful evening to be out on Friday, and it is good that we are together today on this 18th Sunday after the season of Pentecost began, uh, and once again, we're kind of sitting at the feet of Jesus and pondering, what is it that we are called to do and be as followers of Jesus? What does the reign of God, the kingdom of God, look like, and how do we live in it? It is good that we are gathered together. I invite us to stand as we sing our gathering hymn. Friends, we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, that we are perfect in all that we think, say, and do, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. To you, O God, all hearts are open. To you all desires are known. We come to you confessing our sins, things thought, done, and spoken, things left unthought, 
undone and unsaid. Forgive us where we have done wrong against ourselves, our neighbors, and you. Show us your ways, teach us your paths, and lead us in justice and truth for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. With joy, I proclaim to you that Almighty God, overflowing with grace, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sin and makes you new again in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. And we sing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know all our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us. And guide us in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. A little bit of a heads up as we prepare for uh, the readings. Uh, once again, we will be taking a noisy offering uh, to support our crop walk. So I'm just a little heads up. Our first reading comes from Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. Ezekiel challenges those who think they cannot change because of what their parents were and did, or who think they cannot reverse their own previous behavior. God insistently invites people to turn and live. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. And yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Now here, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. And again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? 
For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Our psalm is Psalm 25, which we will read responsibly. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. Our second reading comes from Philippians, the second chapter. As part of a call for harmony rather than self-seeking, Paul uses a very early Christian hymn that extols the selflessness of Christ in his obedient death on the cross. It's a doxology. It praises Jesus for who he is. Christ's selfless perspective is to be the essential perspective we share as the foundation for Christian unity. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing, for, do nothing for selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Word of God, word of life. As you may know, uh, this afternoon is our crop walk for hunger, uh, where we walk uh, to help raise money to help feed those who are hungry, who often have to walk many miles just for clean water. And so we are going to do a noisy offering this morning. Would you guys like to help me? This is very heavy. Would you mind helping me come carry this? So here's what we're going to do. Can you help me carry this? You want to come up? Okay, that's fine. Can you help me carry that? So what we're going to do is we're going to visit these guys. So can you come over here? And we're going to see if they have anything to drop in. All right, there we go. Oh, that's heavy. Oh, here we go. All right, we're going to go back this way. we got to hit everybody. And so we're asking folks to help contribute. They'll let us know if they've got something. I think I see the big guy in the back here. And so what we're doing, oh, here's some noisy stuff. Oh, yeah, excellent, thank you. Right here, young man. There we go. Oh, holy buckets of teas. Wait a second, we're going to have to put, put it down for this. Thank you for bringing it over. All right, young man, right here, right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, here's, here's a couple of coins right here. 
Okay, I think we better put it on the ground for this. Take a look at what she's got. Oh my goodness, this is wonderful. Do you guys see? Go ahead and set it down. She's going to dump that whole thing in here. Wow. Can you hear that? Can you, yeah, can you put your hand on the back of the bag and you can kind of help her out a little bit? Oh, goodness. I know. Ah. There we go. Ah. Generous, they put bills in it. doesn't make as much a noise, does it? Well... And we, and we are so sad. Oh, can you pick that up? You got it? Oh, okay. You can help me carry it to the front, and then I will take it. Oh, goodness. How about right here? What do you think? We'll put it right here. Can you give me five? Thank you so much, young man. Thank you all so much. Holy buckets of cheese. Our noisy offering as a way of giving thanks to God for what God has first provided us. And for this way in which we, in some small way, can help provide daily bread for others. For which we say thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. And now I invite us to stand as we sing our greeting to the gospel. Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. Now, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the crowd, for they all regard John as a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, <clears throat> We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He said to the first, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. He answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw, you did not change your minds and believe him. The gospel of the Lord. I invite you to be seated. Rather than a sermon sermon, I have more kind of a few vignettes to offer today. Some things that I have been pondering on about this text. First is I was kind of amazed to discover uh, in the midst of our Wednesday service that I sympathize with the dilemma of the chief priests and the elders. There they sat. They're stuck between two equally unsatisfactory decisions. If they said that the baptism of John came from heaven, was ordained by God, then Jesus would ask them, well, why didn't you come out and support John? 
But if they denied that it came from heaven, they would buck the belief of the crowds. They'd have a riot on their hands. They were afraid of the people's response. And so they equivocate. Mm. And I can sympathize with their dilemma. And sometimes maybe I can even sympathize with their solution. Not wanting to be faced with explaining their inaction, but also knowing that if they proclaim something the crowd doesn't like, it's going to get messy. Maybe they're concerned for who would get hurt during the riot that would ensue. Or maybe they don't want their phone number and their address doxxed and find angry people at their door, so they don't really answer at all. But I can also voice the opposite. Well, do they really believe in anything? Do they stand for anything? Are they just trying to protect their power? Or do they really think they're protecting what God wants? Now, I can appreciate wanting to avoid the worst parts of taking a stand, knowing that the response you get may not be good for you, yes, but it also may not be good for the folks that you are with, for the community. But time and time again, Matthew keeps saying, faith is tied to what you do, not what you say. By that measure, the chief priests and the elders believed that John's baptism did not come from God because they didn't support it. This despite the crowds that he drew, this despite their own investigation into his ministry, they just didn't want to say what they really believed. Perhaps it's lack of integrity on their part or truly not wanting to provide the Romans an excuse to kill a bunch of Jews because there was a riot during this festival, something that was known to happen frequently. But either way, Jesus says, they did not do what God had called them to do. It's not what you say you're going to do. It's about what you do. Actions speak louder than words. What you do reveals what you really believe, trust, look to. There's a famous quote, preach the gospel at all times when necessary use words. It's often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. You know the statue that you put out in the garden, right? But scholars really can find no evidence that he said that. A similar quote a friend of mine used to have at the tag end of her emails was, remember, you may be the only Bible some people ever read. The promise we make at our affirmation of baptism is to proclaim the good news of God and Jesus Christ through word and deed. All of these things can be a bit challenging. I don't know about you, but often when I hear them, there's a little bit of an ouch moment. Because I automatically think of those times and places where I did not act, where I was proclaiming something other than the good news of God and Jesus Christ by what I did. Where the Bible I presented was maybe one of hatred or neglect or indifference. Matthew reminds us, faith is a verb. It's an action word. Faith is not passive acceptance, but rather active adherence. It is a movement to follow, a movement to care, a movement to comfort, a movement to love. Everyone. But... And perhaps this is what is going on with the chief priests and the elders. You have to make sure that the faith that you live out is actually the gospel of Jesus Christ and not what you want. I've been reading author and theologian Russell Moore's book, Losing Our Religion, an Altar Call for Evangelical America. And part of his thesis is that evangelicals 
have collectively begun to proclaim in their actions something different from the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they have had their view of the kingdom of God shifted to believe it is an earthly kingdom, and that their call is to preserve that, which leads them to speak and act in ways that do not match what Jesus calls us to. In fact, there are a number who actively reject those words of Jesus. And in the face of these words of Jesus, I turn, as I often do, to the cry of the father of the epileptic boy, I believe, help my unbelief. That's my motto. I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help me when I don't act that way. I believe, correct me when I am wrong. I believe, forgive my false proclamation. My final pondering is the question that the chief priests and the elders have for Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? One commentator I was reading this week asked this question of those of us who are public preachers. By what authority do you stand in front of the people of God every Sunday? By what authority do you preach and preside? And my immediate answer is, well, surely not mine. When I was installed as uh, myself and uh, a pastor, I was at that point an associate in ministry, uh, we together were a mission developer. I was three-quarter time, she was quarter time. And that was when Seeds of Faith was, being, uh, was a mission start over in Mount Vernon. And when I was being installed there, Bishop Philip Haugen, in his sermon, looked me right in the eyes and said in front of God and everyone, you're not good enough to do this. And my immediate response inside was, shh, don't tell them my secret here. Now he went on to say, none of us is good enough, that we all need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need each other. We need the grace of God to be able to do the things that we are called to. But what that definitely reminded me was that it was not my authority. It's not my expertise that got me there and into that position. By what authority am I up here right now? In an immediate sense, yours. Y'all, collectively, some of you individually, are the ones who called me into this position. You can also send me right back out. That's within your purview. And in a broader sense, it's the church as a whole who moved me through a process of discernment and education that was spread out over years, involved many different people. And ultimately... By whose authority am I here? It's God's. Who called and equipped me as a unique individual, gave me gifts that the church as a whole, and you guys in particular, have said are good for ministry. By what authority? It's a good question to ask ourselves, isn't it? Where do we root authority in ourselves and when do we point beyond ourselves now I can fully embody the authority of the position that I've been called to as pastor but also understand that authority does not reside in Brian it resides in the office that I am still answerable to someone else and I wonder if that's what the chief priests and the elders forgot. That it was God who called them as sons of Aaron to fulfill that duty. That it was a trust given to them, not power that resided in them. And that God could and often did do new things, act in new ways apart from them and the temple system. 
And I wonder if in some small way we can do that as well in our own lives. Not as pastor or priest, but just as mom, child, student, grandparent. I've talked often about how living in the reign of God means that we are constantly oriented towards other people to be in relationship with them, but it also means being in relationship with God, right relationship with God. Understanding that final authority rests there, beyond us, and that even in those things, mom, child, student, grandparent, we look to God's authority for how to be that. To understand that we have been called to those vocations is what Martin Luther called them. Relationships, roles. We have been called to those by God and how we live those out, at least in the broadest sense, are dictated by God, not us. The upside is, we have job descriptions. We don't have to create them all on our own, right? But we also have the freedom to be individually who we are in those roles. We're not all the same specifics, but we are called to be the same in the ways in which we go about it. It's kind of ironic that the chief priests and elders ask Jesus by what authority he does these things. This is one of those moments where we, as readers, know things that the characters don't, right? And we kind of go, oh, ha, ha, ha. By what authority are you doing these things, Jesus? And we know doggone well that he could truthfully say, my own. As the Son of the Father, whose word goes forth by the breath of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is God doing a new thing in the world. And it's so like Jesus that he just doesn't just come out and say that, right? No, Jesus is a rabbi, he's a teacher at his core, and he tries once again to teach them, to enlighten. I don't think he's trying to put them down or you know, show them up to, to clap back at them or whatever the euphemism is anymore. I wish we would just get rid of that kind of adjective in our description of what is happening in the world. He's direct. He doesn't hold back. But I think what he really wants is for them to see that they have taken God's authority and tried to make it their own. And in doing so, they've lost their authority. They're doing their own and as we go all the way back to the garden and Adam and Eve, when humans try to do their own thing by what they see is right and true, how well does that work out for us? And that's where I am so thankful that this authority is not mine. That we have a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love immovable love for us. Because I don't know about you, but I need it. Because too often I talk a good game, but I don't live it out. Because I take God's authority and sometimes make it my own. And because I don't stand for the truth that Jesus embodies, even when I know I should, because I'm afraid of the consequences right now. And what does that say about what I truly trust? What I believe will ultimately save me. And God and Jesus says to all of us who fall short, come to me, come here, come here. Gives us a big hug. Gives us a pep talk. Right? Reminds us of who he is, who we are, beloved friends, followers, feeds us a meal of Christ's own body and blood so that we might go out tomorrow and proclaim the truth of Jesus in our deeds and use words when necessary. 
to place ourselves in right relationship with others and with God and continue our journey following Jesus on the way. A way that truly is life. Fuller and more abundant than anything else out there. Thanks be to God. I invite us to stand as we sing our hymn of the day. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. God who saves, you know, it helps if you start on the right page. It's going to be one of those mornings. Friends, called by God to care for one another, this world, and all those who are in need, let us hold those folks in our prayers. We put our trust in you, O oh God, as we pray for the church. Give bishops, pastors, deacons, and teachers the gift of wisdom and discernment. Give members courage and boldness to proclaim your truth in their lives. And send your spirit upon us that we might be faithful witnesses. Merciful God, lead us in your truth as we pray for creation, O oh God. We give thanks for the bounty that is in the fields that will feed us, protect farmers and all who bring in the harvest. Make us aware of them, especially on our roads. Empower us to look to the interests of others as we make choices that impact the environment of this world you have given us to steward. Merciful God. Lead us in justice as we pray for those in government, the military, law enforcement, and other positions of authority. Give all of them humble and willing hearts 
looking to the needs of others. We pray also for our enemies and those who persecute us, that your peace might prevail in our lives. Merciful God. Trusting your goodness, we pray for all caregivers and the people who are sick or suffering in any way. Especially we pray this day for Sally, Cooper, Linda, Pat, Nancy, Mike, Patty, Shunji, Bill, Roger, Stephanie, Mark, Marius, Pearl, Dan, Catherine, George, Donnie, Shayla, Joyce, Tom, Rick, Paul, Lane, Katie, Sam, Marilyn, Ronelda, Marla, Karen, Rachel, Morris, and all those who we name now louder in the silence of our hearts. Give them encouragement and consolation in your presence. Merciful God, teach us your paths as we pray for this congregation of St. John. Be at work in us and unite us in your love as we labor for the sake of the gospel in this place. Merciful God. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Before we offer it to each other, I invite you to turn and we will offer peace to those who are watching us online. You'll see the camera up there. Peace to all of you. And now I invite you to share that peace with one another. Oh, I invite you to be seated. This is our time of offering. So just a reminder, if you have a gift you would like to make to the mission and ministry of St. John, the work that we do together, you can make that offering in the gold plate as you go out through the center doors. You can also always make an offering online at our website, stjohnelead.org. And we also have other things to offer today. And one of the things we have been doing since the start of the summer, since the start of this Pentecost season, so for 18 weeks, believe it or not, uh, has been offering for one another places that we have seen God at work in the world. Uh, nature, people, events, happenings. And so I would invite you, ask you, where have you seen God at work today? In this past week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. We, we, we have all fought it in one form or another, yesterday in the Iowa game. Um, mm hmm Yeah, yeah. So the kids' captain yesterday, who who is uh, has graduated per se from from the children's hospital, survivor of cancer, uh, and just the exuberance uh, in the midst of that. Yeah, um, and thinking about all of those doctors, nurses, but also those who have supported family and family, and all of those hands who have contributed to his being there break dancing on the field because he's the kids captain for the Hawkeyes game. And I always appreciate um, everybody in that stadium. Even the guys on the other side of the field who we've just been trying to knock the snot out of. And the officials who nobody likes. <laughs> all turn. And together Wave to those children in the hospital. A moment of solidarity with them. 
a reminder in the midst of all of this, Hawkeyes and Spartans, that no, no, we are human. Yeah. What a wonderful reminder when we can get so caught up in those divisions. Absolutely. And then also the amazing way God works in and through us. Because that healing came through innovations of people who were gifted by God to strive for that kind of healing. What amazing things God has given us. Other places you have seen God at work this week? That's wonderful. I invite you to be on the lookout. We're putting out a bolo for God's sightings. God is out there and at work. And not always in the places we expect, just like the chief priests and the elders figured out, right? So we can see it. And the, like anything, it's like, where's Waldo? Every time you do it, or, or remember the, the, the pictures you used to do, and if you let your eyes focus in just the right way, it suddenly went 3D on you. Do you remember that? It's, it's one of those things where when we train ourselves to do that, we can see it. And so the more we practice, the easier it is to see those places where God is at work. So please keep your eyes open and then come share because that helps us see it better ourselves out there. And now, as we prepare to receive this offering of Christ's own self, his body and blood, I invite us to stand and sing the doxology as we praise God for who God is. Let us pray. Oh, God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts of bread and wine to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy God, our bread of life, our table, and our food. You created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us, his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want, and by this bread and cup make of us the body of your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, and live. I invite you to be seated. I'll invite my communion assistant to come forward. We're going to go by halves today. So we'll start at the back uh, and come forward and we'll do this half. And then when this half is done, we'll start at the back again and you can come forward and we'll do this half. You'll come to me first. Uh, feel free to dip your fingers into the font if you wish to remember your baptism. Then if you wish to receive, body of Christ given for you, and you'll eat, and then you'll step to the side uh, where uh, Marilyn will be with uh, the uh, tray, red as wine, white as grape juice. Uh, when you're done, if you would please uh, just put your cups into the white baskets. All are welcome at this table.
I invite you to stand. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Jesus Christ, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of announcements, announcements, announcements. Crop walk. Um, noon potluck. One o'clock is when we begin to walk. It's out to State Street and back. It is a good stretch of the legs, but not much beyond that, which is fine. So please do, even if you haven't signed up, just come join us on the walk. It will be good to be together with our ecumenical partners from First Presbyterian Church near Ely and the Shuiville Church. High school youth. Um, I know it was homecoming at both Prairie and Solent, but hopefully you will have recovered. Uh, by 7 o'clock tonight, it's game time. Um, we're just going to have a time to hang out, have some games, uh, have some conversation. Uh, we may even have some snacks to share. Um, just to let you know, um, I have the joy of a colonoscopy on Tuesday, so I won't be in the office. Uh, but I will be back in on Wednesday, which reminds me, Wednesday, we're back with our Wednesday evening faith formation. So that's children's faith formation. We've got bridge, we've got confirmation. Uh, the meal will be there again. So uh, if you participate and you want to participate in meal, please do sign up uh, at the sign-up sheet uh, out on the desk. Also, we have one online. Speaking of children's faith formation today, following worship, we do have children's faith formation. Uh, uh, it is uh, something that a group of our volunteers have gathered together. I know it was Rose and Cindy and Joyce and Marlene. Did I miss anybody? Okay, uh, so thanks to them for being willing to provide that. So we invite you uh, to stick around for that. Um, just so you know, uh, fellowship, uh, you know what to do because uh, we don't have a specific person who signed up to help. There's coffee out. We pulled cookies out of the freezer for you. You guys know where things are, what to do, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, and that's what kind of week it is as we enter into this October season, right? Friends, I invite you to receive this blessing. The God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. And we sing.